so we're starting chapter two and we're this is part one because what we're going to do is the first three sections and then we're going to have a test all right and it'll be a good time of review like break for a little bit and then learn some more new stuff just a reminder here's the class website tons of information on that website for you resources everything all right before we get too deep into the lesson i want to talk about this thing called definition of the derivative okay and we're going to kind of develop it together so you already know that a line okay a line has the same slope no matter what point you pick if it has a slope of two then that's what the slope is a line slope does not change okay however a curve which would, you know, look something like that, the slope is constantly changing. Like here the slope is negative, then positive, zero, then negative, and so on. Okay? And so this is what we're really going to focus on in this class. Okay? Although we still will do a little bit with lines, particularly tangent lines. And so slope of the tangent line is going to be something you, a phrase you hear a lot. Okay? It means the, what the slope at a point is. So let me... Um, draw a curve and let's say i wanted you to find the slope at this point right here i would say what is the slope right there well what i really mean is what is the slope of this tangent line right there okay those two things would be the same and the way we find this is by doing derivative okay so i'm going to talk a little bit about the formula for definition of derivative and i'm going to use some of the phrasing that we heard on the very first day of school Okay, when I kind of told you about what calculus is, we're going to use that. So on this picture down here, the first thing I want you to do is to change that C to an X. It's just a particular X value, and we're just going to call it X. Now there's another X value over here, which we could call X2. What I'm going to do instead is say that the distance between the two X values is delta X. Do y'all remember what delta stands for? Change. change, right? So if this is an x value and then I go delta x more to the right, then the new x value is x plus delta x. Okay, now let's talk about y values. Okay, because what we're about to do, uh, that's a bad picture. Let me redo that. We're about to find the slope of this line. Okay, if I want to know what is the slope of this line, I need to know the y values. So what if x is the x value, then f of x is the y value. It's just f of whatever the x value is. So what would be the y value when we have x plus delta x? Yeah, it would just be f of that thing. And so what this is now, these are the two y values, these are the two x values. So this is two points, right? Do y'all remember what this type of line is called? This is not a tangent line. It's a secant line. And really, any time you've been doing slope before this class, you've been doing secant line slope. You just didn't call it that and you didn't need to because there was only one type. Um, the way we would find this slope is by doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, slope formula, or you could think of it as rise over run. So we would do f of x plus delta x minus f of x. That's just like saying y2 minus y1. And in the denominator, it'd be the x's being subtracted. x plus delta x minus x. And normally we have numbers there don't let the notation bog you down. I'm really just kind of developing a formula here, and then um, the notation will get a little bit simpler. Just a minute. Do you see anything, though, that cancels, maybe in the denominator? The x's, right? So the only thing left on the bottom is this delta x. Okay, and all of this, even though it seems like it's heavy notation, you've done that before. Okay, what's going to be new? All right, and by the way, do y'all remember what type of rate of change this was called? Average rate of change. And if you didn't, that's okay. That's why we're reviewing this today. Okay, so that's all great. 
that's all basically algebra. Algebra 2, Algebra 1 even. You didn't use this notation, you used slope formula, but it's the same concept. So if this was distance and time, this would be your average speed. Like on a road trip, overall, how fast did you go? Okay, however, if I wanted to know how fast you were going at a very specific point, then I don't need two points anymore. I need one point. And the way we do this is to kind of, if we could pick up this point and slide it down the curve so that now I only have one point. And once you get this one point, then you have what we call a tangent line. Now I'm doing this color coded in my notes. You may just want to make sure you label it appropriately or something or get a highlighter or a pen out if you want. So everything I've done in green is the secant line. This in blue is the tangent line. Um, all right, so how do we find this slope? Okay, you have never before today been asked to find the slope at one point. You could approximate it. I mean, look at this slope of this blue line right here. Is it positive or negative? Positive. Do you think it's bigger than one or smaller than one? It looks pretty flat to me. So probably smaller than one. And we would need like a grid or numbers to get any more specific than that. So you could approximate it, but you can't find it exactly. And so in order to go from two points to one point, in other words, I don't want this point up here. I want both points to be right there next to each other, really close or basically on top of each other. What needs to happen to delta x? It needs to get really small, like really small. Okay, so this slope is going to be represented using limit language because that's how we get things to be really, really close to something. And so this would be the limit as delta x approaches zero. So let me re-explain why we want to do this. We want delta x to be really small so these two x values are really close to each other. Okay, now the rest of this is going to look the same. I'm still going to do f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over h. And this right here is what we're going to call the definition of a derivative. So I've developed it for you. You're not going to go through this every time you need it. You're going to really just memorize this. And I'm going to kind of help you figure out how to do that. What type of rate of change is this if it's happening at one instant? That's your hint. Instantaneous. We are going to use H instead. Yeah. <clears throat> so on the next page, we're going to rewrite this formula down. But instead of delta X, we're going to use another letter. And the convention is to use H. Oh, you're like, hey, why'd you write it? Oh, Ms. Brooks has just been teaching this too many times and is like skipping ahead in her mind. Thank you. Sorry. I thought you were just getting ahead of me. There should be a delta X down there, right? I'm sorry about that. We are going to call this H. I'm just getting ahead because that happens sometimes. Okay, so on the next page, um, we're gonna, this is where we actually really get into the specifics of this. That was kind of to develop the formula. So just to emphasize, the slope of the tangent line is the derivative. So if you're ever like, what's the derivative mean again? Like, what is it? It's the slope of the tangent line. Okay, and so the way we do this is by using this formula. So the limit as, and we're going to use H now instead of delta X. It makes it a little bit easier um, because like X and delta X look an awful lot a lot like, and it can be confusing. So this is the convention that you'll see. This formula, you need to know it. So when you're doing problems with derivatives, my suggestion would just be to write it down when you do it. Um, okay, a function is differentiable. So this word looks like different. Different makes me think of like change, which is derivative. It just means the derivative exists. I didn't mean to cross that off. I meant to underline it. If the derivative exists, it's differentiable. It's like an adjective to describe that you're able to take the derivative. 
Okay, so there are several notations, and you can thank Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz for these different notations. All right, um, and we could talk more about this on a different day. So this right here is kind of the one we're going to focus more on today. That symbol right there means prime. It means the derivative. Okay, two different people developed calculus at the same time. They developed their own notation, and um, so that's why I have a different notation, and it's called dy over dx. And you need to be familiar with both of them. What do you think the D stands for? It doesn't really stand for derivative, but it's not bad to think that. It really stands for delta. Okay, change in y, delta y over delta x. All right, and here's another way. Sometimes we see d over dx, and inside is what we're taking derivative of. So you could see a function would be inside there. So I'm going to just throw this out there today. We'll talk more about it another day. Um, but I just, we're going to mostly deal with the prime notation. Okay, so let's look at number one. Example number one, it says find the derivative, and then we're going to find the slope. I know that slope has to do with derivative, and then we're going to write the equation of the tangent line. These three things, you're not always going to be asked to do all three. Like, it could just be the last part, but they're all, they're all related, okay? So the first thing, finding the derivative, let's just go ahead and write that f prime of x equals, and let's write the formula. The more you write this, the more you're going to know it. I've written it probably over a thousand times in my life. That might be an exaggeration, but several hundred times, I'm sure. You're not going to have time to write it that many times, probably. But the more you write it, the better you're going to know it. Okay, so for this example, f prime of x equals, okay, it's going to be a big fraction. And so f of x plus h means take your function, but instead of x's, we're going to put x plus h in their place. So instead of x squared, we're going to have x plus h squared. Instead of 3 8, uh, 3x, it's going to be 3 parentheses x plus h. And then the minus 1 doesn't have an x, so we'll just put minus 1. So everything that I've written is just the first piece, this f of x plus h. I still have to write minus f of x. So f of x is just the function the way it is. Notice I'm using parentheses because there's more than one thing behind that minus sign. I'm going to have to make sure I subtract everything. And you know what? Miss Brooks made a goof. Today's not my day. Anybody find it? What I forget to write right here. And that's not a bad thing for me to do because it kind of will help. I find that students really remember this kind of stuff. We got to write that. That's a key part because without the limit part, this is just slope of the secant line. The limit part has to be there to make it what we need, we need it to be to get into the tangent. All right, now we just finished a whole chapter on limits. You know that you typically go ahead and take this number and you plug it in for h. Without like really doing a lot of math, mentally think what would happen if we plugged zero in for h? What would happen to the whole top? It would be zero. Everything in the front would cancel with everything in the back. And then what would we get on the denominator? Zero. And what do we do when we get zero over zero? We do more. You can go through that step if you want, but I'm telling you, it's always going to happen. So let's just go ahead and do the do more part. And this do more is going to be some algebra. So I'm going to keep writing limit as h approaches zero until I'm ready to plug zero in for h. All right, now I have to do x plus h squared. For whatever reason, this really gets students. So I'm going to go off here to the side, and I'm going to do this over here. Okay, I'm timesing it by itself. x times x, x squared. Outside would be xh. Inside would be xh. And then h times h is h squared. Over here, I'm going to write it as x squared plus how many xh's are there? 
two, so two x h plus h squared. If you can do that step in your head, great. Do it. Next, I'm going to uh, distribute that three. So three x plus three h. And really what I'm doing here is just a bunch of algebra steps. Minus x squared minus 3x and plus 1. Okay, so you got to do all the algebra to break up that numerator. And if you did this correctly, a bunch of stuff is about to cancel. I like to start at the back because all of this is going to go away. So like plus 1, minus 1, those cancel. What else do you see? The x squareds and I heard 3x. So all of that stuff cancels. So we still got a little bit more algebra to do. Before I can cancel this h in the denominator, I need to factor it out of the numerator. And I can because each term that's left in the numerator has an h. So I factor out an h. I'm left with 2x plus h plus 3. All right, once you factor that h out, now you can cancel it with the one in the bottom. We couldn't do that until we factored it out. Okay, if I plug 0 in for h now, I won't get 0 over 0. What I will get is 2x plus 3. And that is your answer. That is what f prime of x equals. So I'm going to write this. That's f prime of x, and it's what we're going to kind of call the slope function. Notice that it's not a number. We're used to slope being a number. Okay, and that's true with lines, but with anything with any curve to it, the slope is not a number. It's its own function. Okay, I know this seems like a lot of steps. I have two things to say about that. One, once you practice it, it won't seem like that many steps. Two, very soon we are going to have shortcuts, and you're going to be like, Miss Brooks, why did we ever have to do this the long way if there's shortcuts? Well, not everything has a shortcut, and there are very specific ways the AP test asks questions to know, do you understand this process? Okay, so by soon, I mean this week, you're going to know a shortcut. And if you were in pre-AP algebra or pre-AP pre-cal last year, you might remember the shortcut. I'm not going to go over it today, though. Um, okay, so that was all part A, and that really is the hardest part. So part B is find the slope at um, x equals negative 1. So anytime you want to find the slope at a number, what you're finding is f prime and then at the number that they tell you. So to find the slope, you got to use this slope function. Okay, that's why we call it the slope function to really help you understand, hey, I'm finding slope. And we get one. That's a specific slope at a specific place in the graph. Okay, so I'm going to draw what we've come up with so far over here. You don't, I could, if I wanted to be mean, I'd be like, hey, everybody draw this parabola by hand and let's do this. I just want to show you so you have an idea of what's happening. Okay, at x equals negative 1, right about here, here's the tangent line. Okay, see that slope? That slope is 1. That's what we found by doing all this algebra. Okay, part C is finding the equation of the tangent line. All right, in order to do the tangent line, you need a point and you need a slope because we are going to use point slope formula which you should really be comfortable with you had to do this on your after parties i mean you should be really good with this by now okay they tell us to find the equation of the tangent line at x equals negative one so that's the first half of the point okay we still got to find this y value what was the slope? We just found it. It's 1. Okay? You can even draw a little arrow there in your notes to help you know. They told us in Part B, 
find the slope when x equals negative 1. We use the derivative to find that slope. So the only other piece of information I need is this y value. How, like how long have, has a math teacher asked you, here's an x value, find the y value? Have you been asked to do this before? Yes, for years, since junior high, really. So we're not using the derivative for this. This is something we're going to use the original function for. All right. So right here, this is going to be f of negative 1. Notice there's no prime. This is not derivative stuff. And so this is going to be negative 1 squared plus 3 times negative 1 minus 1. And so that's negative 3. So negative 3 is the y value. And you can even kind of see here on the graph that that makes sense. That point right there is at negative 1, uh, negative 3. The slope is 1. When you have all of that information, you're going to use point slope to write the equation. So we're going to go y minus negative 3 equals the slope, which was 1, x minus negative 1. And really, it is totally fine to leave your answer like that. If it's multiple choice, then you probably are going to have to get y by itself. So what you would do to do that is just y plus 3. That turns into x plus 1. So y equals x minus 2. That's the equation of that line right there. You don't have to graph it in order to do these steps. I'm just showing you the graph to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing. Okay, so for those of you that don't like vague stuff, you like rules and steps, this is for you because it's the same thing every time. So let's look at the next example. All right, again, why don't we go ahead and just write the formula. The more you write this, see if you can write it without looking up here. The more you write it, the better you're going to be at it. Okay, so for part A, we have the limit as h approaches 0. This is another quadratic, so it should work pretty similarly. We're going to take x plus, plus h and plug it in for the two x's. So that's going to be x plus h squared plus 2 x plus h plus 5. That's all of the first part. Then minus f of x. Put a parenthesis there so that you make sure you subtract everything you need to subtract. And don't forget the all over h. We're not doing anything with it yet, but by not writing it, your step is wrong. Okay, go ahead and see if you can break that up and simplify this down and get a final answer on part A. How's everybody doing? Doing all right? It's a lot of little details, but the good thing is you know how it's going to end up. You know that, um, whoops, I kind of missed it up right there. There we go. You know that what you have left should all have an H. So when you have your limit as H approaches zero, you should be able to factor out an H that's going to cancel with the H in the denominator. Then you're left with 2x plus h um, plus 2. Now I'm ready to take the limit, and you got 2x plus 2. If you have an h still in your answer, just know that that's never going to be part of your final answer. Because remember, all the h's should tend towards 0. Okay, part b, find the slope. So same thing. Remember, this is our slope function. 
If you think of it that way, then when you're asked to find slope, you know, oh, I plug this into the derivative. So plug one into the derivative to find that slope. And we get four. So when x equals one on this parabola, the slope of the tangent line is four. What's f prime of four? Let's see. 10. And then f prime is zero. Good. Okay, which one of these slopes is important for doing part C? Why? Yeah, x equals 1. This right here is representing the slope of the tangent line. So I'm going to go ahead and write it as the slope is 4. What's the x value for my point? You just use that 1, whatever they tell you. Now, see this where it says, what is f of 1? That's what we don't know. So they're kind of giving you a hint on this problem. They're saying, hey, you don't know something. You don't know f of 1. Use the original to find the f of 1. It doesn't have anything to do with the derivative. Okay, so I'll do this over here on the side. f of 1 should be 1 squared plus 2 times 1 plus 5, which is 8. What that gives you is the y value that you need right there. So write yourself whatever notes you need to know about how you come up with that 8. Once you have the point and you have the slope, you're ready to write the equation of the line. And you do not have to simplify it. You can just leave it just like it is. If you did simplify it, then um, you would have 4x plus 4. Okay, so that's kind of like all the algebra way of looking at a derivative. We can also look more at the graph, and that's how we started, and that's how I'm going to end the lesson today. Okay, differentiability and continuity. Let's talk about how these are related, and I'm going to give you a couple of pictures to go off of, and then on the next page, we're going to graph some derivatives. So it says a function is differentiable on an open interval if it's differentiable at every point. If a function is not continuous, can you give me an example of why a function would be not continuous? Not a proof, but just an example. A whole, a vertical asymptote, those are kind of the main ones, then it is not differentiable. You cannot find the derivative at a whole because a whole is not even there. Same thing with the vertical asymptote. There's no points there, so you can't find what the slope should be. All right, however, just because a function is continuous does not mean the function's derivative. So let me give you an example. Here is a picture of, this could be absolute value function, and that's a sharp turn. That's called a cusp. This is continuous, but it is not differentiable because of this point right there. Let me show you the difference. If it was a smooth curve, that would be okay. But if it's a sharp turn, that is not okay. Okay, this is called a cusp. There is no derivative at a cusp because there's no slope at a cusp. It turns, it just changes from one thing to the next really fast. Um, and so there's no derivative. Another example would be something where just for a split second it goes vertical. Okay, just for a very split second. Okay, if I asked you, what is the slope right here? What's the slope of a vertical line? It's undefined. It doesn't exist. So guess what? There's no derivative right here. If you go vertical for a split second, there's no derivative. I'm not talking steep. I'm talking completely vertical. This is pretty rare. Um, it's usually like they even have to tell you that this is happening because it's really hard to tell just by looking at a picture. Okay, so this recap just kind of goes back over those rules. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next page. And we are going to look at these graphs. All right, so these are some functions. And let's go ahead and put little arrows on the ends of these. We're just going to do these top two examples today. 
Okay, so part A says determine the interval for which f of x is differentiable. Okay, remember what differentiable means. It means you can find the derivative, you can find the slope. So if I had any areas where it was not continuous, I would need to account for that. If I had a cusp or a vertical tangent, I would need to account for that. So what's happening here that's causing my differentiability to not be all real numbers? There's a cusp right there at x equals 4. Okay, so it'd be negative infinity to 4 union 4 to infinity. If you wanted to write this as all real numbers except x does not equal 4, you could write it that way. I want you to be comfortable with interval notation though because that's how you'll see it mostly. Alright, so this is where the graph is differentiable. Now let's actually graph the derivative. Okay, now when you have like lines that are straight, it's actually a little bit easier because you know how to find the slope of a line and that's why this is the first example. So what is the slope of this line? Negative one, the whole way through, right? From this end to this end, the slope is negative one. We can do that with a line. We're not gonna be able to do that with a curve. So what I'm gonna graph is a y equals negative one. So whatever the slope is, that's your new y value for your slope. Or, I mean, you're graphing the slope. All right, I'm going to put a little hole right there at 4 because remember, we don't have a derivative at 4. We don't have a slope at 4. Okay, what about this piece? What's the slope of this line? Positive 1, right? So I'm going to graph y equals positive 1. Look at the domain of the graph that I just graphed. It is the same as this interval. That's a way you can kind of check your work. Okay. The examples we're going to have more often are going to have a bunch of curves to them. Okay, so look at this. Lots of curves here. So first, let's just see. Where is the interval for which f of x is differentiable? Okay, so what we're looking for is where it's not differentiable. Do we have any places where this is discontinuous? No, it's continuous everywhere. Do we have any cusps? Nope. We have some turns, but they're smooth, rounded turns. Do we have any vertical tangents? No, it's steep, but it's not vertical. So this is differentiable everywhere. So whatever graph I'm about to draw, the domain should be all real numbers. That's something that you can kind of help you as you go through the problem. All right, there's some strategies we can use here. All right, the first thing is let's just analyze the easiest slopes to calculate, which is going to be zero. Can you see a place on this curve where the slope is zero? like at that maximum, right? So right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to locate where the slope is zero and I'm going to draw a zero or an x-intercept on the graph. I'm going to do that for all, other, all the other points. Okay, so right here is the same situation. Right here, same situation. The slope is zero up at the top of this peak, so I'm going to graph a zero or an x-intercept. And then there's one more right here. So I locate where is the slope equal to zero, and then I graph those as zero points. You know, zeros meaning roots or x-intercepts. Okay, the next thing is I can't say that the slope of this section is positive or, or I can't say like exactly what it is, but I can say if it is positive or negative. Yeah. So the slope here is changing, but it is positive the whole way through, right? Look at this section over here on the left. Positive slope the whole way through. So I'm going to put a little plus sign up there. And what that means is that my graph should be above the x-axis. Because above the x-axis is where the graph is positive. Okay, what about this next little section? From this peak to this low point, what can you say is true about the slope everywhere? It's negative. So, I don't know like how negative, but I know it, it is negative, so it's going to go below 
and you got to come back up and hit these. It's kind of like when you graphed rationals, those x-intercepts were like your anchor points. I don't know if this is down far enough, and I don't care. This is just a sketch. Okay, what about the next section? What can you say is true about the slope? Positive. So we're going to go above. And the next section is negative, and if you notice, there's it alternates. That's pretty standard. It doesn't have to alternate. It could go, you know, there are other things that can happen, but we're not going to focus on all the scenarios right now. Now, if I had an equation of the, this f of x, I would probably just take the derivative of the equation and then graph that. But this right here is another way to do this. These types of questions are most often seen as multiple choice. So on the AP test, you are not going to have to graph a bunch of these, but you're going to have to be able to pick out which one matches what. Tomorrow, um, you guys are going to get a little bit more practice with this. I'm going to leave something with the sub to show you just a little bit more examples, and then you'll have time to practice it. Mm -hmm. Why did you 